I believe that white progressives cause the most daily damage to people of color. A black person will write on Twitter, you have to listen to the black people who are the real black people, the black people who black people listen to. No, no. Explain to everyone what critical race theory is. Critical race theory. Critical race theory. Critical race theory. No one knows exactly what it is. They know it has something to do with race, and it's some kind of a theory. Some of the headings for this video, so you know what you can expect, what you're going into, read such as critical race theory, race reductionism, nice racism, anti-racism and equity, slavery and institutional racism, meritocracy and individuality and whiteness defined. If that sounds like something up your alley, of course stick around. If it doesn't, stick around anyway. Hello and welcome back to the Late Onicles. It is I, the Leighton in question, and today we are going to be starting on our adventure. We are going to be embarking on this journey in our review of Nice Racism, the sequel to the New York Times bestseller that is White Fragility, the book that spent over 100 weeks on said list, which, you know, if you can quick maths, over two years. And so it's quite the cultural phenomenon, even if you don't know who Robin DiAngelo is, certainly in the next few months, if not years, the ideas that are to be found in a book such as this are more than likely going to be coming to an institution near you soon. An institution, a school, academia, media, so on and so forth. But what is the book about, I hear you ask? Well, here's a quote for you from the previous book, page 91. Anti-blackness is foundational to our very identities as white people. So there you go. Oh, what's the book going to be about? There you go. There's a little... Uh, <laughs> taster for you. It's one of those kinds of things. So, you know, like I said, it's going to be coming to you in some facet, whether you like it or not, whether you're for it or against it. And so this is for you if you want to get ahead of the curve, so to speak. It's even coming in places that even I wouldn't expect it. So for instance, I came across a blog post by the NHS, which is, you know, the UK's public health sector, so to speak. Hey, if you need health care, here's some free health. Care. So they put out a blog post called Dear White People in the UK and they actually specify D'Angelo by name and her book. They're like, oh, you should read White Fragility. So like, why would you need to read such a book? I've read the book and reviewed the book for that matter. I can't fathom why that would be necessary. But as I say, it's popping up in all kinds of weird and wonderful places. Maybe less so on the wonderful, certainly in the weird. So yeah, whilst I'll say that this book is, you know, certainly more geared towards a US audience, I would say. It's definitely relevant to, as I've mentioned already, a UK audience, what with the NHS thing, but then also, in her own words, page 24 of Nice Racism, she says, or mentions at least, in my experience over the past 25 years in a range of academic, corporate, community, and governmental institutions across the US, Canada, Australia, South Africa, Europe, and the UK, blah, blah, blah. If you live in a Western country, this book is more than likely relevant to you and you're probably starting to see the trickling down of ideas found in books like these and that's probably only going to ramp up in the days to come. And then finally in this section of why is this relevant to you? I should also mention that it seemingly draws from a lot of the schools of thought, ideologies, doctrines, so to speak, that are very much relevant in the zeitgeist currently. So just to name a few, we have page 11 of the introduction, the Roman numerals, etc. She mentions critical race scholar Shireen Razak. Then also on page 20 of the introduction, she mentions Michel Foucault, who is commonly associated with the school of postmodernism. Then on page 123, she mentions whiteness studies, Michelle Fine. And then on page 153, she mentions uh, Kimberly Crenshaw, the critical race theorist, the person who is most widely attributed as um, founding critical race theory, as well as intersectionality. But why me in particular to lead you through this murky swamp, I hear you ask, why should should you listen to me in particular? And my answer to that is, you shouldn't. Why the fuck would you care <laughs> what a stranger on the internet has to think? But that's probably an unsatisfactory answer, and so I'll list off a few things that perhaps you'll find relevant, perhaps you won't, but I'll say them nevertheless. So perhaps most foundationally, I should point this out. Page 13 of the Roman numerals, the introduction, etc. Robin DiAngelo writes... I write books and articles specifically as a white person to white people. My goal is to help us get out of that denial 
about our racism and be less harmful to black people and other people of colour. So essentially this book is by white people for white people and I feel like certainly from my reading of the previous book it seems like the book is intended only to be read by white people and certainly in a very insular pocket. So, you know, I, I don't know if you've noticed or anything, but I, I'm, I'm somewhat melanated. I don't know why I showed you my hand as if you could see my face that's also brown. I'm an idiot. A person. I'm not the exemplar of all black people. I'm not the avatar of the black population. I'm just, I'm just a guy. But yeah, it would probably be a good idea for, you know, an actual brown person, a black person to actually chip in and be like, well, or mm, good, a good, got a good point there, you know? Additionally, and uh, you know, some of you might remember this, I actually did a review of the prequel to the book that we'll be going through today, White Fragility, and as far as I can tell, it actually is the most popular review of the book certainly on YouTube, and maybe in fact in the world, because in total it has 600,000 views, which is ridiculous. It was a deviation from what I had done before, because prior to that it was exclusively comedy. So I was trying this out, and you know, certainly you people, <laughs> you people, despite the topic and controversy and whatever, it seems to have gone down very well, and I would hope it's because I was thorough and hopefully entertaining and interesting in my analysis. Um, and so I'm hoping to do that here too. I don't think this series will have as much as a pop-off as the previous one, and that's fine, because we do it for the love of the game, and also Mommy Algorithm doesn't fuck with us in the way that she once did. Where art thou, my queen? <laughs> I want to be thorough, I want to be careful, and hopefully interesting and entertaining on the way. You know, I had to annotate this myself as I read it, pen in hand, I had to type up the quotes by myself, because god forbid there'd be a free fucking version of a PDF online. I've sweat and tears for you, my dude. I'm not looking to dunk on her or the book, you know, if it's bad, it's bad, if it's good, it's good. I will point out though that one of the points that I most definitely will not be making is saying, oh my god, can you believe she said this whilst being white? I do not care, I care about people's arguments, I seldom care about the person making said argument. If it's a good argument, it should stand by itself, regardless of who is espousing it, in my opinion. And then finally, in my credentials section, I suppose, uh, I also have a master's degree, which is to say that I have two degrees, and ordinarily I wouldn't really care about this kind of stuff, and quite honestly, I don't care about it now, even in this context. Um, but you know, we're more than likely going to be bumping into kind of academic terms and things of that nature, and from my experience at least, coming across language like that can take a while to kind of wrap your head around. It can feel like learning a second language, so to speak, and so it's probably helpful for you to know that I know, that you know, that I know, that you know. Okay, I'm familiar is what I'm saying. I can unpack the terms um, is basically what I'm getting at. When I did the review for the previous book, I'm pretty sure I likened it to the series Hot Ones, which, you know, was to say that we started out with some kind of milder things and then we uh, <laughs> moved up the ladder and got spicier and spicier as we went along. And I think, oh, get them, baby! Based on the way that I've structured this, uh, a similar thing's going to happen. However, this time perhaps it's similar to a roller coaster in that you go up for a time and then before you know it, you're dropped down into the pits of hell. <laughs> This will be a kind of video thesis of sorts. This is for me to sort out my thoughts, so to speak, if you can imagine. It's like, you know those old motorbikes of the old days, and like, you would have the primary rider and then there'd be a buggy to the side. You're in the buggy to the side. This is primarily for me to, to, to speak my thoughts into existence, and if you enjoy it, great. If you don't enjoy it, that's also great. I'm not trying to convince you. This is just my thought process, let's say. And so, because that's all that this is, there will be no ads on the video, so there'll be no, uh, uh, interruptions. We got there. Uh, you can just enjoy this or not enjoy this uh, to your heart's content. Hopefully it's informative and entertaining along the way. Some memes in there, some in real life examples. And final thing, I suppose, because D'Angelo does this for her own audience, I should probably say, trigger warning, there will be jokes. <laughs> uh, I do use humour. And I want to say a little bit about why I use humor. So what is my style? Like, if you're excited, of course, drop a comment throughout or merely at the end. It's up to you. I will leave that in your hands. I'm just glad to have you on board, quite frankly. From paperback to hardback, 
Is the upgrade worth it? Allow me to be your humble torch bearer through this murky swamp as we go through nice racism and the world we're living in together. So the first question to answer above anything is why a sequel? Why is there a follow-up book to an already incredibly popular one? What else is left to tell, shall we say? And so rather than me telling you that, let's go off of her answer to that question. This is page 21 of the introduction. She says, this book is a follow-up to white fragility. I do not set out to establish that systemic racism and white supremacy exist as I did in that book, nor do I set out to establish that all white people receive, absorb, and are influenced by the racist messages continuously circulating across the society we live in. Rather, I proceed from these premises and assume that my readers do too. In White Fragility, I made a claim that white progressives cause the most daily harm in black, indigenous, and other racialized people. Here, I will explain some of the specific ways we do so, because many of these ways may be less obvious, they are also more insidious. So from reading the book, because I have read the whole book, but we'll be going through it primarily uh, linearly, but I'll be joining certain dots across the chapters as we go. Uh, I would say that rather than the first book being aimed towards all white people, this book is more so aimed towards people that identify as progressives or white progressives specifically. So in that regard, this is almost kind of like a self-help book for those people. So what is there to be contentious about? I hear you ask. Everybody hates racism, am I right? For the most part, yes. There's probably some outliers that don't and are very much in favour of racism, but generally speaking, you know, racism bad. And so I would say that the controversy, the contentiousness probably lies in the definitions, I would say, because as far as I can tell, over the years, we've went from racism to systemic racism to racism again, which is to say that racism over here was between one person to another. I don't like you because you're a particular skin colour, that kind of thing. Or, you know, worse, thinking that they're inferior genetically or otherwise. But then that turned into systemic racism, which wasn't, oh, it's not an in-between two people or a group thing. It's actually a system of racism. There's a bunch of dots to connect. There's a whole system, so on and so forth. Oh no, all racism now, or the, what we're categorizing as racism, Racism is merely the the system of racism so that's where you get into like well who can be racist who can't be racist and generally speaking in books like these the consensus is that only white people can be racist because it's only white people that have power is that true but let's read on it seemingly becomes so taboo to even mention the kind of classic version of racism insofar that you would call it that i would just call it the normative version the the layperson version it's become so taboo to even consider that that like that almost puts you out as an outlier it's like, oh you're not in the group with us that kind of thing and, and you know she kind of finger wags at this uh, page 44 because she says given the dictionary definition in relation to how complex and nuanced racism is writer annie renee chides honestly as soon as someone refers to the dictionary when discussing racism it's clear that person has never delved deeply into trying to understand racism it's a big old red flag every time what a thing to refer to that as a red flag oh you know i was dating such and such and they were calling a b and c but then red flag oh get away from me oh don't want anything to do with them you know it's a it's divisive intentionally, I would say. And they don't mean that in a way that's like abrasive. It doesn't have to be abrasive divisiveness, but it's like there is us and there is you. You get red carded. We're actually the correct ones because we believe in the system of racism, whereas you, you're just a silly little something or other. You don't actually know, you know, you're not with the click like we are. And, you know, in backing up this kind of, it's only white people that can be racist, allegedly. Uh, page 19, the Roman numerals. I use racism and white supremacy somewhat interchangeably, but racism can be thought of as the systemic outcome of white supremacist ideology. I should point out, nowhere in this book once does she outline what explicitly is white supremacist ideology i've come across sources where i know what it means because i've looked around and that will be coming to you very soon and i think you'll find that interesting but as i say because it, you know she's already outlined that she's writing to a particular audience i think she assumes that the reader knows it and if you're in her camp so to speak you'll be oh yes i know exactly what that means i don't explicitly know what that means and certainly not from her but yeah as i say only the whites can be racist apparently which is why she uses them interchangeably oh when i say racism i mean white supremacy because as we all know no other racial tension can occur between groups that don't contain white people am i right this is 
sarcasm. <laughs> I feel like it's obvious, but I should probably mention just for the sake of clarity, nowhere in this series will I say that racism doesn't exist. That would be, that would be silly, it would be a farce, at best a jape. Of course it exists, we're arguing definitionally what that means and also what should be done about it, what are the presuppositions packed inside of the definition of which kind of racism you go with, as well as the solutions, I would say, because some of them will get there when we get there. So yeah, there's this kind of racism, there's that kind of racism, and there's that kind of racism that is mentioned in books like these, and books like these, here's a flavour to tickle your little butthole. <laughs> To give you a, to give you a little bit of flavor, I already mentioned the one part of you know one of the presuppositions, one of the kind of founding axioms for what this kind of definition of racism entails. I already mentioned you know the page ninety one anti blackness is foundational to our very identities as white people. On top of that, however, these will be also from uh, White Fragility, the previous book. For example, perhaps you grew up in poverty or are Ashkenazi Jew of European heritage or were raised in a military family. Perhaps you grew up in Canada, Hawaii or Germany or had people of colour in your family. None of these situations exempt you from the forces of racism because no aspect of society is outside of their forces. There is no outlier as to, oh, am I not racist? Am I considered not racist, Mommy D'Angela? No. Insofar that you are born white, insofar that you are white, you are considered racist. Not my words, hers. Also from White Fragility, page nine. Interrupting the forces of racism is ongoing, lifelong work because the forces conditioning us into racial frameworks are always at play, our learning will never be finished. And so again, insofar that you're born white, the only thing that you can do essentially is kind of uh, repent, do the work, educate, educate yourself, all the other slogans. And then again, just to convey to you that the thought process, the ideology or framework, however you want to refer to it, has not changed across the two books. This now is from nice racism, more so towards the end. She's been at this for 25 years. Her opinions are not going to flip-flop from book to book, so to speak. But so, you know, just again, to kind of build up the, the world that we're embarking on. Page 150 from Nice Racism. The other task is to face the internalized superiority that results from being socialized in a racist society, the ways in which we consciously or unconsciously believe that we are more important, more valuable, more intelligent, and more deserving than black people. So, you know, that's probably, uh, I think that conveys the unequivocal guilt aspect. If you're, if you're white, guilt, feel bad, but can you not be racist? Is there ever a point wherein you cannot be considered to be racist? I don't want to spoil the ending. <laughs> But the answer is no. You are racist. The only thing you can do is uh, repent, educate yourself, so on and so forth. The best you can do is be as less racist as possible and be as anti-racist as possible. But those things are not in conjunction with each other. They're mutually exclusive. It's not because you become less racist, which books like these would suggest that you couldn't do anyway. But hypothetically, let's say you could, to make the point, even if you became less racist, that wouldn't make you more anti-racist. If you become more anti-racist, which is what this book is supposed to be doing, you won't become less racist by proxy because they're mutually exclusive. There is no thread between them. If you're white, you're racist, just binarily. White person, racist, not white person, not racist because the system of racism. Hell of a business model. She's found a way to monetize white guilt, which, you know, I doubt she identifies as an entrepreneur, but she really tapped into a market there. So I think we should have a round of applause for Mommy D'Angelo, I'm gonna be honest. That's big brain. That's 200 IQ. I can only aspire to such a thing. I'm putting out free content on the internet. I'm a fucking idiot. <sighs> Before I go on, I should probably address the elephant in the room, so to speak, the proverbial elephant in the room, which is to touch upon the uh, influx in popularity or certainly knownness of the term critical race theory. I think, at least, the reason why this term has been latched onto more than some of the other terms that are similar, so to speak, is purely in the naming of it. When you refer to an idea, or even oneself as anti-racist, it's difficult to be like, well, actually, I'm opposed to that, even if the ideas in such a thing are a bit uh, open to 
open to criticism, open to critique, because it's like, well, oh, you're, oh, so you're saying that you're actually anti, anti-racism. You know what that means? Two negatives makes a positive. That means that you're racist, you know? It's difficult to say that you're, that something called anti-racism should be investigated because maybe it doesn't have some good ideas or something. Whereas something called critical race theory, maybe that's a bit, uh, maybe that is perhaps open to scrutiny a bit more than something called anti-racism. It's like the people that refer to themselves as progressive, who are you to say that you're, so what, everything you say and do is progressive now? I've seen some of the most regressive ideas come out of people that refer to themselves as progressive. It's like, well, if you're against me, then you're anti-progress. What are you talking about? Anyway, so I'm going to go through the, I suppose, academic origins of such a term, and then we'll go through how it is seemingly playing out in real life. Because critical race theory, debatably, intentionally so, is difficult to define. I would refer to it more as an umbrella term as opposed to a specific thing in general, because you have critical race theory, which is derivative of critical theory, which is derivative of, and a response slash critique to, Marxism. So let's have the most whirlwind tour of what Marxism is and then critical theory and then we can continue on with critical race theory and then indeed the book. This is a process called contextualization. So Marxism is a framework that began to be developed by Karl Marx in the 1800s that essentially suggests that the locus of power is to be found in the economic. Those that control the means of production, so to speak, so retain the profits of that, generally referred to as the bourgeoisie or the ruling class. There's the underclass also, the workers, which are referred to as the proletariat. And then from there, there is the assertion that depending on what class one falls into, essentially determines one's education, the media that they consume, their politics, so on and so forth. It's somewhat reductionistic, but it's not useless. It has some useful aspects about it. Critical theory then was developed by a man called Horkheimer in association, in association with, in association with the German Frankfurt School, which suggested that rather than look at power in relation to the economic, that they would look at power itself and who has power so on and so forth so a traditional theory is one that seeks to understand and describe the world compared to a critical theory which seeks to scrutinize problematize which is where you get terms like problematic to uh, problematize them dismantle them the, the systems so to speak and then build something in its place and generally speaking it's the systems wherein there is a unbalancing of people that have power and don't have power that need to be dismantled and rebuilt from the ground up, essentially. So so you have somebody else's definition. Uh, where is this taken from? Stanford, something or other. A critical theory may be distinguished from a traditional theory according to a specific practical purpose. A theory is critical to the extent that it seeks human emancipation from slavery, acts as a liberating influence, and works to create a world which satisfies the needs and powers of human beings. I would say that on the surface, that actually sounds quite good. You know, you need to have a critical eye, that's what critical theory is, having a critical eye towards society, the, the, the forces at play, so on and so forth, the ideologies that get circulated within it. You need that. You know, there is utility in that. However, because you can create a critical theory out of anything that ostensibly has a power differential, it's precisely that. You can create a critical theory out of anything, regardless of how trivial it is. How many of you go to the grocery store and you need somebody to help you with the top shelf? That excerpt was taken from the University of Carolina at Chapel Hill. That is a professor saying that supermarkets are oppressive because short people exist, therefore it's not that deep. To refer to a supermarket as a system of oppression is like... So now that we have a decent understanding of what critical theory is, uh, to you know, to be hypercritical of society, to say none of this, to have more of this, if there's a power differential, so on and so forth. So then, of course, critical race theory asserts that the primary axiom of power differential in society as a whole is hinged upon race. White people at top, people of color at bottom. There is the white people are the oppressors. The 
people of colour are the oppressed, the white people stay at the top, it does not change, the brown people or the people, people of colour are the, the, the underclass, it doesn't change, there aren't exceptions, there is no coming together, there is only conflict, there is only uh, class conflict. Power games, it is a zero-sum game. I should probably point out at this point, however, despite us talking about critical race theory, Robin herself doesn't actually refer to herself as a critical race theorist. I think insofar as her kind of using a term to describe herself, the most that I've come across is her refer to herself as a sociologist. However, for me, at least, I feel like it's a bit, uh, if it walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, because like she certainly uses the same ideas, you know, the white people are oppressive, the brown or people of colour are the oppressed. Is a thing a thing if the person refers to themselves as it or not? You know, that kind of thing. Ontology, how do you define things, so on and so forth? Because insofar as the, uh, the, the how is it playing out in the real world, this is what it seems to be. There seems to be this kind of like semantics game, this kind of no true Scotsman fallacy of like, well, does critical race theory exist? Is it being taught in schools? Is it being instantiated in the workplace? And to an extent, I would say that it is, even if it's not overtly, even if the, you know, the worksheet that you're given doesn't say critical race theory at the top, you know, the ideas in there are still the same. Because critical race theory originated as a term within law, but then it seemingly being generalized out to society and some of the ideas within it. And so here is an excerpt that I found from Kimberly Crenshaw kind of like making my point even though there are people that I think at least have critical race theory ideas that would say actually no it's not critical race theory because so this is her talking about when she was coining the term critical race theory and what it's become now. So she says but the work wasn't quite done yet. Was this an independent thing or merely a descriptive or generic term? So the name critical race theory now used as interchangeably for race scholarship as Kleenex is for tissues, blah, blah, blah. So again, this is from the person that made critical race theory is saying essentially if it's race scholarship, then in her mind, she treats it as critical race theory. And then also from critical race theory, an introduction, page seven. Although CRT began as a movement in law, it has rapidly spread beyond that discipline. Today, many scholars in the field of education consider themselves critical race theorists who use CRT ideas, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, as I said, Robin doesn't refer to herself as a critical race theorist, but she certainly uses some of the ideas. And so debatably, if I were to go on the broader, more abstract use of the term, she cer she definitely falls into critical race theory territory but you know if you're oh no because it's just about law so then how is critical race theory playing out at society at large what if you reject the presuppositions of critical race theory white people oppressor people of color oppressed doesn't shift so on and so forth internalized racism all the other buzzwords one answer to that question you know how is this playing out in the real world we can look to MSNBC. Just because I do not want critical race theory taught to my children in school does not mean that I'm a racist, damn it. <laughs> it actually, it does. It's just another example of Republicans turning kids into a wedge issue. So there you have it. If you're against the race binary, white people, racist, always, nothing they can do about it, people of colour, oppressed, can't be racist systematically because they don't have power, so on and so forth. You're a racist. We're also seeing a push for CRT to be, t CRT, critical race theory to be uh, taught in schools or not taught in schools, because again, is it critical race theory? Isn't it critical race? Critical race theory is not taught in elementary school. It is barely taught in law schools, frankly, in the level that it should be taught. Why don't you want our schools to teach anti-racism? Why don't Republicans want their kids to know the tradition of anti-racism in the United States. It's also like, if critical race theory isn't being taught in schools, then why are a bunch of American mayors voting on it? The next resolution is 68 in support of critical race theory in public K-12 education. This resolution outlines the US Conference of Mayors support for the implementation of critical race theory in public education. Are there any questions or comments on number 68? The main issue, optics-wise, for critical race theory, or the critical race theory debate, is that it's seemingly, within the past two years or so, because it is such a, or can be used as such a catch-all term, it's seemingly, amongst certain groups, become somewhat of a boogeyman, so to speak. So, for instance, I came across a story by a group called Moms for Liberty that, as far as I could tell from the articles that I came across anyway, they're 
main point or the point that they were contrary to was because their kids were being taught about a woman called Ruby Bridges, who is the first African-American woman to have attended an all-white school. That, to me, is just a piece of American history that should be taught, in my opinion. That's not critical race theory. This is a thing that happened. She's literally 60-something. She's in her 60s. She's literally still alive today. This is just teaching history, in my opinion. That's not critical race theory. They're trying to poison our kids' minds. But again, it seems to be anything that has like a a tinge of a, a racial issue. There is a group that's so kind of like frail, so to speak. But then again, that's the issue because then it becomes like they become the straw man of like, well, see, anything to do with race, they just don't want to talk about it. And it's like, there is a minority of people, you know, the, the crazies get airtime for a reason because everyone can point and laugh at them. And see, we told you so. There are many a people that are opposed to ideas like this, ideas that are found in this kind of book that aren't, no, my daughter shouldn't actually learn about. Seemingly, there is the presupposition that if you're against critical race theory, it can be only because of uh, three reasons, either one of them or all of them. It's either because you're white, racist, or Republican. He says in a loaded manner. Daddy teaches you can be anything in this world that you want to be, right? Don't daddy teach you that? Yeah, and it doesn't matter if, if you're black or white or any color. Doesn't matter if you're black, white, brown, yellow. yellow. And and how we treat people is based on who yeah. they are and not and what color nice. they are. And if they're nice. And this is how this is how children think right here. Critical race theory wants to end that. Not with my children. It's not gonna happen. You gonna deliberately teach kids this white kid right here got it better than you because he white? You gonna purposely tell a white kid, oh, the black people are all down to suppress what y'all doing right now is already something I do in my community right now to speak out against stuff because black folks are getting told by other black folks, oh, you know you ain't gonna be able to do nothing out there in the world because them white folks ain't gonna let you get no, oh, you know you're not gonna be able to do it here because you know, white, the, the white man, the white man gonna keep you down. You gonna sit there and tell me this lie of critical race theory? Uh, this, this, this is the reason why black folks can't get ahead because of white folks? Are you kidding me? This is what we come to now. I can't believe we're even talking about this right now. I'm out there with folks in their face. I've been doing stuff since I was 18 years old, talking to black folks. And you know what? None of them are buying this nonsense. What we are against is the teaching of contested political ideas as if they are accepted facts. We don't do this with communism. We don't do this with socialism. We don't do it with capitalism. And I want to speak about a dangerous trend in race relations that has come far too close to home to my life. And it is the promotion of critical race theory, an ideology that sees my blackness as victimhood and their whiteness as oppression. And now, contextualization over, we have reached the sacred realm. We are finally at learning about nice racism. What is nice racism? Who is it targeted towards? What are the goals for the book, for the reader, for society? Page two. Throughout this book, I use the term white progressive as a stand-in for a particular strain of whiteness. I am not referring to someone's political affiliation, such as Democrat or Republican, Labour or Tory. I use the term to refer to white people who see themselves as racially progressive, well-meaning. Nice. They might call themselves woke or even claim to be beyond race. White progressives are generally on the left side of the political spectrum, but can be moderate, centrist or soft conservatives. Already, to me at least arguably contradiction number one because it's like oh it doesn't actually pertain to politics but it's also oh but they are predominantly left leaners okay but we'll continue they can be any age but because they see themselves as progressive in terms of racism they do not see anti-racism efforts as directed at them they already know all this stuff and are not part of the problem white progressives can be of any socioeconomic class although middle and upper class white progressives tend to offload racism onto poor and working class whites. There's an overt part of agreement in there for me, which is the part toward the end where she says that it's offloaded, because I think that that uh, is true. It's like, oh, if all those poor white people would stop being racist, those ones in middle America with their mayonnaise sandwiches and shotguns, I don't know what I'm saying, but you get my point. I feel like there's the kind of like metropolitan elite, so to speak, that like, uh, oh yes, I'm I'm in with the lingo and so on and so forth, when, uh, you know, they might be some of the most uh, <laughs> racist ones about, you know what I mean? I will say though, for me at least, there seems to be a schism in the definition that is given for what constitutes as a white progressive, because woke I feel like there's two definitions in here that she kind of smashes into one because like on one hand she says that they're 
beyond race which to me is kind of just you know the kinds of people that are like oh they might say something like i don't really see color that kind of thing which is not a literal thing it's like i understand that there are ideas in the zeitgeist so to speak i don't buy into that that's what they're saying you know i don't see color i don't buy into these stereotypes and so on and so forth so that's one and then there's the other people that damn near like bend over backwards so to speak oh i'm sorry i offended you i didn't mean to even if what i did you know there's like two different seemingly the people that are kind of like nonchalant about it and then there's the people that, that i tend to think of as woke people woke people as far as i can tell don't consider themselves to be beyond race if anything they make it the most paramount thing in the world like the most primary marker of importance so off the bat this notion of the white progressive is kind of like are they nonchalant are they the bend over backwards thing they're seemingly smashed together into one thing seemingly though her strain of what she refers to as uh, the white progressive is what she would consider to be the evolution of a term that uh, martin luther king introduced he's certainly the person that introduces the term to her or that's how it's written in the book at least because on page three it's uh, an excerpt from uh, martin luther king i have almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the negro's great stumbling block in the stride towards freedom is not the white citizens council or the but the white moderate. I would argue that there is a categorical distinction between a white moderate then and a white moderate now. Because, you know, back there, oh, <laughs> silly little black, oh, you want rights to vote and so on and so forth. Like, to be moderate on something like that, it's a bit, uh, okay, yeah, you're a, you're probably a, a bad person or closer to a bad person than not. Whereas now, what's constituted as a white moderate is generally the people that aren't in a particular kind of bubble or use a certain strain of lingo you know fundamentally they're not the same thing to me but seemingly that's the i feel like this passage this part that i've just read to you is kind of like written in a way that like oh this is the natural evolution of martin luther king uh you know re the white moderate that kind of thing it's like i actually don't think that that's true and i actually don't think that martin luther king's ideas even fit with anti-racist ideas anti-racism tm ideas because you know the whole hey judging a person by the content of their character as opposed to their skin skin color is all these people care about seemingly so to me that's backwards but and now nice racism the title of the book what does nice racism mean i hear you ask i'll primarily be citing from a chapter called what's wrong with niceness which in my opinion is probably the spiritual successor to the chapter in white fragility known as the good bad binary that essentially suggests that a substantial part of the reason as to why white people won't admit to their racism their internalized racism the racism that they can't even say that they have it would create a schism in who they view themselves to be because there's this conflation of well if i say that i'm racist that means that i'm a bad person and so some people will not admit to being racist so they can keep their idea in their mind that they are a good person now on paper i think that that makes sense you know sometimes there are aspects of ourselves that we're none too fond of that we would rather dismiss so we can keep a kind of like grander image intact so to speak and so nice racism then are acts of racism that somebody supposedly didn't mean or won't admit to as being racially motivated let's say but don't take my word for it take hers this is from pages 49 to 50 Niceness requires that racism can be acknowledged in acts that intentionally hurt or discriminate, which means that racism can rarely be acknowledged. Being nice also allows for absolution. If they don't intend or perpetuate racism, the act cannot and should not count. For example, in response to some of his elementary school's staff dressing up like stereotypical Mexicans and other staff dressing as a border wall with Make America Great Again written on it, Middleton Idaho School Superintendent John Middleton acknowledged poor judgment but insisted there was no malicious intent. You know, I looked into this issue because I thought it read as ironic in the book and so I thought I'd look into it. To me, it reads as though, like, they're making fun of the typical uh trump supporter or, like, conservative by being like, this is what they think Mexicans are and they're, like, in the hats shouting Ariba and so on and so forth do it got maracas and whatnot i don't know either way i thought it was ironic that being said optics wise it looks awful and it's probably kind of indefensible that would be an example of nice racism this idea that like you can do something that ostensibly is kind of so racist but then be like well i didn't mean for it to be racist certainly on paper it makes sense i would say obviously uh to me at least the contentious issue is in determining what is and isn't racism and who 
decides because there seems to be throughout the book at least this kind of idea that if you're called racist or something that you do is referred to as racist it's kind of like indefensible which is to say that like you cannot defend yourself from it you're supposed to just take it and you take it and move on, learn and so on and so forth but then it's like well just because somebody refers to something or assumes that something was racially motivated doesn't necessarily make it so. However, I will say under this paradigm, because you can kind of like essentially, it's it's the, the issue of thought crimes essentially, and you can determine who has and hasn't overstepped, merely depending on whether you want to do that or not. And so even some of the best people by, I suppose, the, this kind of framework, you know, the people that shut up and listen and take it on board and things like that, even they're not safe. And in fact, they might be some of the worst offenders. So, page 51. I recently co-led a three-day workshop for a group of wealthy white women. They were so nice! Exclamation point. There was lots of head nodding, smiling, politeness, and respectful listening. The women were not debating or appearing to resist the content. Well, that seems good. Yet niceness in this context actually functioned as a passive aggressive way to conceal difficult feelings of anger or numbness. Presumably these women, and for some reason I feel like it's in New York, that's not written in anywhere, but I just feel like it's New York. <laughs> Presumably this is the best audience. They came to you willingly, and yet there's this assumption that they're angry or numb, and that they're actually being passive aggressive because they're not resisting the content and are actually taking it on board, as far as I can tell. This in the business is what we refer to as a Kafka trap. Be damned if you do, damned if you don't. The most ironic thing that I can find is, you know, the central idea in white fragility is that anger is a response by white people when you call them out for being racist. Wherein, in this case, they're not getting angry at all, ostensibly. She, you know, she says they're being polite, they're smiling, so on and so forth, but it's still like, oh, that's actually racist still somehow. So if you get angry, you're racist. If you don't, if you don't get angry, you're still racist. Page 52, so the following page, she's, you know, continuing on with this story. In strategizing on how to break the facade of niceness with a group of owning class white women, we asked ourselves what the room might have felt like to a black woman. I imagine that for her, that room would not have been experienced as a safe space. Inauthenticity does not feel supportive. So there's this kind of like a priori assumption that because they're, they, they're seemingly liking and appreciating the content, that they're being inauthentic. And I'm not like cherry picking quotes here. Like I'm trying to pick ones that exemplify the book as best as I can. And in the event that the quote alone does it do it, I'll contextualize around it. But there's nothing in here that says that they were like inauthentic in another way. Like she didn't share an elevator with one of them and she, one of the women made like a bitchy comment about one of the other ones and that like tipped her off of like, oh, from this point onwards, I thought they may be a bit disingenuous. There's literally no example of that. She just assumes that they're inauthentic because they're not resisting the content. Even that framing is, oh, what, you're not resi resisting? The most heinous thing out of all of this, though, to me at least, is this kind of like, this manifestation of a conceptual black woman to make her point for her. You know, she's like, oh, how would the room feel if there was a black woman here? How the fuck would you know? And, and does it matter which one? Black people aren't a monolith. Black women aren't a monolith. Why? How would you even conjure that up as a thing? Like, oh, how would the room feel? Going into this book, I thought there might have been more humility this time around than the first time around. Because there's a point that she makes about, like, you know, I don't claim to speak on behalf of black people. So she makes that point. I'm not speaking on behalf of black people, but she will materialize a conceptual black woman to make her point that, oh, they wouldn't feel safe because you're so not resisting to the content and your niceness is a facade, even though you're paying me to do this and you're here voluntarily. What kind of 4D chess are we talking about, bro? Mind reading. It's it's mind. It's this attempt at mind reading, it seems like. So it's a non-starter. If you show signs that you're racist, you're racist. If you don't show any signs that you're racist, you're also racist. So now that we have gone through what the white progressive is, what nice racism is, we should also talk about the, uh, this idea of a choir, because there is indeed, <laughs> there has indeed, there's been an influx of, you know, people that think in these terms and so on and so forth, but D'Angelo seemingly makes the claim that there's no such thing as a choir because there's no such thing as a true anti-racist, and so I'm kind of like... <laughs> 
<laughs> Isn't this whole thing a non-starter then? It's like, hey, become an anti-racist. Okay, I'll try. Am I there yet? No. And part of the reason you're not there yet is because actually you can't get there. Page 56. She's quoting someone called Ian Haney Lopez. I don't think there is anybody here who's fully anti-racist. Part of being anti-racist is recognizing the ways in which we are steeped in racism and that it imbues our thoughts and our judgments in really surprising and surreptitious ways. We have to be constantly on guard against it. That to me read like there are just like waves in that atmosphere of racism and racist thoughts that you just have to like deflect every waking moment of your fucking life it feels a bit like a religious idea of like oh you've got to be on guard because the devil can put his little clutches and talons into you at any point hell of a hell of a business idea this of like hey there's no choir so continue giving me money page 37 she says on a weekly basis, I speak to groups of mostly white people and give a presentation on whiteness and white fragility. Quite often, I am told beforehand by the white organisers that I am preaching to the choir. In other words, trying to persuade people who already know and agree with the message I am delivering. In this case, the choir in agreement with my message would presumably be white people who understand systemic racism, see their role within it, and are actively engaging in anti-racist practice. And right there, I know there is no way I can be standing in front of the choir. In fact, I do not believe that there is a white choir raising their voices in anti-racist harmony. The very idea that there is could be problematic. Could be problematic. So again, there is never a qualitative distinction. You cannot transcend your racism. You will always be racist. You will never not be enough anti-racist, which again is a hell of a business move, I would say. And the reason why I keep mentioning this is because obviously there's the selling of the books and so on and so forth. But if there was such a choir that she's suggesting that they can't be, she would presumably be out of business because like you can only sell to people that which they do not have, let's say. And I've done a little bit of digging and on her website, as time has went on, she's got paid more and more for this. And it's like, uh, it's very lucrative is what I'm saying. From her website, she says, my average fee for an event in 2018 was 6,200. In 2019, it was 9,200. Really uh, rising up the ranks there. In 2020, as of August, it has been 14,000. Okay, so what does she say in the previous bit that I just recited to you? On a weekly basis, okay, so let's assume that there's four weeks in a month. She makes 14 grand per session. Speaking events generally are one to three hours long. Okay, four weeks in a month, four lots of 1,400. Quick maths is 56,000. She makes what some of you make in a year. She makes in a month and then wants to come to your work establishment and tell you that you're privileged. Are you fucking mad, bro? Also, to assert that there's just no choir for this whatsoever, when there has so viscerally been the propagation of terms and uh, discourse pertaining to this topic, it's like there clearly has been an influx. Like, she has to maintain that there is no such thing as a choir, obviously, but like, to say that there's like, there's no qualitative distinction is like, absurd to me. She does give some kind of outlining for some things that you could perhaps consider to be, if you do these things, you're more in the, the choir doesn't exist, but if you do some of these things, you're more a part of the choir than not, but the choir doesn't exist, Again, it's a non-starter. There's a lot of non-starters in this book. But anyway, this is from pages 40 to 42. She gives a bit of a checklist. She says, let's use a checklist adapted from a handout created by Professor of Education John Rabel to measure how likely it is that the white people I stand in front of every day are in fact the choir and can claim of these skills. I demonstrate knowledge and awareness of racism. That seems kind of standard. Again, we'd have to be rigorous or it might get contentious when talking about, well, what do you constitute as racism, so on and so forth. But on paper, that seems fine. I have demonstrated that I am open to feedback on my own unaware racist patterns. Again, what constitutes a racist pattern, but otherwise on paper makes sense. I use my position as a white insider to share information with BIPOC. It's not that deep, bro. This isn't Russian espionage, you know what I mean? An insider, like I, also what information, just information as a whole? What information are we talking about, my broski? You know what I mean? Oh, there's a two for one on 
Coca-Cola and Pepsi in the dining hall today. Oh, you're such a good white ally. Like, what do we, can you specify, you know? I did also come across this thing where like, again, in circles such as these, the kind of like critical race theory ones, the anti-racist ones, the destiny, so to speak, if you are a white person, is to become something called a white abolitionist, which I feel like is echoed here, you know, because she says to be an insider. It's like, it's kind of like this, this idea of like race betrayal, to be betraying all of the, I don't know, be a pro proponent of black people by proxy. I don't know, this allyship thing. Oh, I'm an ally to- No, you're not, bro. Sit down. You know what I mean? I raise issues about racism over and over, both in public and in private. Starting to get a bit on the fence here. Over and over. I don't know about that, because you already sound annoying. I already know what kind of person you are. I accept, with no explanation or proof necessary, a person of colour's experience. Now we're getting into kind of deep water, because it's like... Because, you know, in books like these, th th sometimes it's like swatted away, like in a kind of contrarian way. Like some people... Because some people are like caricatured a straw man is like, oh, these minorities, they want special privileges, that kind of thing. And then people on this side will say, no, actually, they don't want a special privileges. They just want to be treated equally, that kind of thing. Whereas to me, this idea of like not needing proof or explanation, that seems like a... That seems like special treatment to me. I'm going to be honest. And it's also like, it doesn't specify in what uh, realm, let's say, is like, is this purely on racial matters or is this a person of color's experience as a whole? Because it doesn't specify racial matters. And then I'm like, we can all cast our minds to instances where a person of color has lied. And then obviously that gives people ammunition to be like, see, they lied. It's like, oh, you fucked it up for all of us. Jesse Smeye, I don't know how you say his fucking name. And I'm not going to start now. Fucking lying ass trying to get a raise. Anyway, I recognize my own limitations in doing anti-racist work and have set up ways to be accountable to BIPOC people. First of all, grammatically speaking, that doesn't even make sense. Black, indigenous, people of color, people. What the fuck are we talking about, bro? People's already in the acronym. That's what the POC is. People of color. BIPOC people. People of color people. <sighs> Whatever. Which, which BIPOC? Again, we're not a monolith. Which ones are you picking to be allegedly accountable for? I'm going to give a different answer to Candace Owens to Ibram X. Kendi, for instance. So it's like, it seems kind of redundant is all I'm saying. No matter how anti-racist you become, you will always be racist. You can't ascend the, you can't become the archbishop of anti-racism, so to speak, unless you're Robin DiAngelo. But then even then, out of the presentation of humility, she couldn't refer to herself as that. I mean, that's a silly title, the archbishop of anti-racism, but you know the point, like that that she's there, that she's found the place, because as she said, there is no choir. And again, there has to be no choir, because if there was a choir, there would be a finish line, and then the number of people that she could, uh, <laughs> preach to, seeing as we're using that terminology, it would have a cap. Because as soon as you say, here's the criteria, this section I have referred to as anti-racism and equity. So now that we know what a nice racist is or a act of nice racism is, we can move on to what the goal, insofar that there is one, is for such a reader of this book. It's to do with anti-racism, or as I would like to call it, anti-racism TM. Page 180 of Nice Racism. You ever just forget the name of the book that you're reviewing? How do we live anti-racist lives as white people within a racist society? Again, as Kendi instructs us, the opposite of racist isn't not racist. The opposite of racist is anti-racist. Anti-racist is active, not racist, is passive, and passivity in a racist society is racist. I love 4D chess. Hey, if you're not doing everything in your power to be what we deem to be anti-racist, that means that you're racist. It is, it's the most like patently kind of like, if you're not with us in the most absolute sense, you're against us. You may have noticed that the, she mentions a, a person there or a name there, this, this Kendi person, who is it I hear you ask? And so, since we're talking about racism, you're gonna get a two for one today, baby boy. Not only are we going through nice racism, but I guess we'll be having to go through excerpts of fucking, uh, how to be an anti-racist by, uh, Ibram X. Kendi, or as his birth certificate would have you known him, Ibram Henry Rogers. This is from How to Be an Anti-Racist, page 
64. To be anti-racist is to view the inequalities between or racialized ethnic people as a problem of policy. If there are disparities in a group, it's because government and corporations and institutions have deemed it so is essentially what that means. Page 18 of the aforementioned book. An anti-racist policy is any measure that produces or sustains racial equity between racial groups. Equity interesting. That'll come later. So from here we can deduce that the philosophy is that disparate outcomes can only be a result of disparate treatment. It's a form of inductive reasoning. And then in addition to those points that I just shared with you, we have on page 19, if discrimination is creating equity, then it is anti-racist. So from here, it seems as though there is the active encouragement that if you're in pursuit of equity, then that means that something is anti-racist, because the point of anti-racism is to create equity. But what is equity, I hear you ask? Because sometimes these words are used interchangeably. Equality or equity, and in the most layperson way of creating the distinction between the two, generally speaking, equality refers to the equality of opportunity, whereas equity is equality of outcome. So, for example, if this were like a, a foot race, for instance, you would say everybody gets to participate in the race. That would be equality. Equity would say everybody gets to participate in the race insofar that everybody that participates gets to the finish line at the same time, because that is equality of outcome. And I'm not saying that one is necessarily better or worse than the other in an absolutist sense. I think it's contextually relevant to what is being deduced to be equal here or equitable there, for instance. So here's an example of equity that I think does work. So let's say you're a parent, you have three children. Heaven forbid, I would never have children at a point like this, you know, because, you know, climate change and, you know, have you seen the world? I would never have kids. It's so immoral. Anyway, you're a parent with three kids and for the sake of just ironing out unit sizes, let's say one of them's small, medium, the other one is large. Let's say one of them's five, one's ten, and one's twenty. Because he won't fucking move out, you know, he's twenty years old, he just needs to, you know, look at the... Anyway, if you go for equality, you say, here is a dish, the dishes are basically identical, and you say, here is the dish for all of you. Perhaps that dish is enough to fill up the small child, the the, the little sprog. However, the, the medium one, the, the ten-year-old, it's not enough. Maybe they're half full, however you would characterize that, and then the 20-year-old, maybe they're a quarter full, let's say. So even though you were equal, so to speak, because they all got the same thing, they don't reach the same equal outcome. They're not all full or quenched in the same manner. So in that regard, I would say that's a point where you actually need equity because you take into account people's different circumstances, their variables, let's say. However, the issue then becomes an issue of complexity. That example that I just gave, there was one variable, hunger, in relation to size, I suppose. So maybe there's two, let's say there's two variables, let's say. It's much more simple compared to, you know, something societally large anyway. And so to convey, I suppose, like the central finger wag to this idea of different outcomes, you can infer disparate treatment. Again, here's a kind of like silly-ish parallel, let's say, to kind of contrast that. So I'm the eldest of a myriad of siblings, three of us that have reached the age of 19 thus far. I'm older than that, obviously, or maybe it's not obvious. I'm just a little teenage little twink. <laughs> now, we've all had the same parent, household, whatever, the same income, the same treatment, so on and so forth. But at the age of 19, we have all been in different places. Now, if, you're, if you come from like an equity doctrine, the assertion or assumption rather there would be that the reason why you've come to different outcomes at 19 is because you were treated differently. And obviously, as you scale this out to something society wide, let's say, the differences are only going to get bigger. It's normal to have disparities between groups, which is not to say good, by the way, because I'm not justifying the differences necessarily. I'm just saying that it's normal to have disparities, you know? There's disparities between my siblings at the age of 19, despite identical circumstances. It's going to be the same when you scale it up even bigger, let's say. And I'm not saying this as an excuse, because I think I used a clip last time of uh, Coleman Hughes talking about some of the disparities that don't get spoken about, because we always get told, oh, white people on top, and then they keep black people down, that's why they make less, and other people make less, so on and so forth. But then when you some break some of those groups down, you know, what constitutes as white and what constitutes as black, so on and so forth, the, the ethnicities within them, I suppose the narrative breaks down a little. For example, the average white American household of Russian descent earns a dollar 
for every 79 cents earned by the average white American household of French descent. In America, both of these groups would just be called white people. But if you categorize them by the country in Europe they came from, you get a 21 cent on the dollar pay gap. Does that imply that the U.S. is systemically racist against white American French people? Well, no. It's just that these disparities are the norm. So anti-racism or like in a pro-equity doctrine would suggest that the only reason why one of those white nationalities makes more than the other one is because somehow the game is rigged and that's why the differential is there and it's like well maybe that's not necessarily the case it's normal to have disparities between groups with entirely different histories entirely different patterns of migration entirely different demographics entirely different average ages and this is equally true if you break down quote-unquote black people into subgroups and sub ethnicities you'll find that Nigerian households make not only more than the American, average American household, but much more than the average, say, Haitian American household. Yet both of these people are black. If we can't even attain parity within races, what is the thinking that assumes we should be achieving parity between races. And I'm not making an excuse for whites being on top because generally speaking, I don't know if you know this, but certainly in the realm of economics, white people aren't on top at all because in fact, it's Asians. So on average, white Americans make $67,937 per household. You know who's at the top with $119,858 per household? Indians, isn't that interesting? And then you have Taiwanese, Lebanese, you've got Chinese in there, Iranian, Japanese, Pakistan. You know who's up there also above the whites? This might be a bit unexpected. Nigerian Americans and Ghanaian Americans, isn't that interesting? And a statistic that you just wouldn't know because it would kind of disrupt the narrative. Oh, America and other Western countries were created to uphold white supremacy. And it's like, well, Asians making way more than whites on average or you know some of the ethnicities is obviously because again this is my point some of ethnicities between those groups that we refer to as white black asian some are going to make more some are going to make less and obviously we kind of just conglomerate them to be white black asian when you know there's much more diversity within the groups than we're often led to believe this smoke and mirrors is done intentionally, is my point. And I think this is precisely what, uh, I came across a person called Kenny Zhu. He has a book called The Inconvenient Minority, I believe it's called, and I haven't read it, but I would presume he's Asian. I don't know if you could tell by a, a, a last name like Zhu. That's racist for you to assume. <sighs> Bro, the inconvenient minority, and presumably part of that book is, hey, we're always told that Asians, because they're people of color, they are held back and they don't do well in America and other countries and so on and so forth. It's like, well, actually not. These are some uh, some some uh, stats and data and whatever that uh, run contrary to that. The most hilarious thing, I mean, it's not hilarious, it's horrendous but you know you derive comedy where you can i came across this is a few months ago actually a school in was it washington the headline reads such that it's school district decides asians aren't students of color in their latest equity report, administrators at North Thurston Public Schools, which oversees some 16,000 students, lumped Asians in with whites and measured their academic achievements against students of color, a category that includes Black, Latinx, Native American, Pacific Islander, and multiracial students who have experienced persistent opportunity gaps. Which this kind of adds credence to this idea that like you are only considered a person of color insofar that you're considered to be less than somehow. Because like undoubtedly, I mean, for the past, you know, 10 years or so, or I mean, much longer, Asians have categorically always been considered people of color. Because again, all people of color is, is the conglomeration of anybody that's not white. You're black, you're Asian, you're Hispanic, get in there, you're a person of color. Did we decide this? No, whatever. Again, it kind of adds credence to this idea of like the Marxism thing. It's just like bourgeoisie, proletariat, just swapped out with races, but then it's like, oh, actually the Asians are doing too well, so they can't be considered the, the underclass. Now we're gonna move them into the upper one, which is whiteness. So now Asians are white by proxy. I really think there is the high possibility that 
Asians, I mean, I've already gave the example of the school, but I mean, like, as a whole, there's very much the possibility that, like, the people of colour thing, you know, because all these terms shift all the time. Ten years ago, it was people of colour. Twenty years ago, you could say coloured people. Now it's BIPOC is the term. All these terms shift and who is in them and isn't in them change all the time is what I'm saying. Anyway, and so in terms of these, like, unintended consequences in pursuit of equity, did you know this? America consists 5% of Asian. 1 in 20 people in America are Asian. Okay, baseline. However, 10% of the people that study at Virginia Tech, the university, 10% of them are Asian. So, in the event that you're pursuing equity because 5% of the US are Asian, if you're distributing, let's say, educational resources equitably, then presumably that means for Virginia Tech, they have to cap their... Asian enrollment at 5% because Asians are 5%. Otherwise, technically speaking, they're overrepresented. I would say that there's nothing wrong with that, personally speaking. I don't think equity is a, is a sustainable idea. But yeah, seemingly Robin at least backs uh, it up. She's into it because, you know, on page seven, uh, this is from White Fragility, the book that came prior, but um, I'm building the connections out. She writes, uh, Kendi goes on to argue that if we truly believe that all humans are equal, then disparity in condition can only be the result of systemic racism. Finally, just to remind you from uh, uh, How to Be an Anti-Racist, page 18, Kendi again writes, I've, I've said this to you before, an anti-racist policy is any measure that produces or sustains racial equity between racial groups. Define equity, because you can you can have equity at some levels and not other, you can have equity, for instance, at a country level, but what if it's not at the same at a state level, you know? The doctrine itself is incoherent and unimplementable, and so if this is the kind of the end goal, that honestly is like a paradox because it's not an end goal. It's not a goal that you can reach. You can fight forever and uh, slurp up uh, money for forever. How much money did Ibram X. Kendi get from Jack Dorsey's, uh, you know, the Twitter CEO? I think it was like 10 million to, he funded him. And it's like, dude, these ideas are not robust or implementable. Insofar that anti-racism TM, the, the goal of that is equity, then, in my opinion, as far as I can see currently, that's no, no good. good. As incoherent as the equity doctrine is, there are still arguments to be made in its favour. And I think the biggest one is the title of this section called Slavery and Institutional Racism. Now, there are obviously instances where people of different circumstances invariably have different opportunities compared to people that have greater, I suppose, starting circumstances, let's say. And maybe in the kind of like small minutia of like starting grounds, those differences can be overcome and, you know, the differences are kind of, in terms of like where they end up, it's similar enough, let's say. However, I don't know if you've paid attention to American history, but there's a particular group that, historically speaking, has had it uh, pretty fucking rough, let's say. We're talking about slavery, people. We're talking about fucking slavery, all right? <laughs> and then on top of slavery, of course, as you know, you've got redlining, you've got you've Jim Crow laws, you've got, uh, I mean, a myriad of things. I recently came across a thing called the GI Bill, which apparently was a thing wherein, because after World War II, there was a bunch of economic prosperity that uh, governments helped civilians, I guess. They helped them to get on the housing market. However, that was only afforded to white people. And you know, now in like the 21st century, You'll, if you're a young person watching this, there is damn near zero chance that you're owning property. And you know, you look at houses like back then that were, I don't know, pennies, bro. And now they're worth hundreds of thousands. And it's like, it's a way of building up generational wealth that a particular strain of black people did not have the option to. That to me would be a good example of, you know, cause there's always, does systemic racism exist? What does it even mean? You know, that to me is like, that's system that is systemic racism to me. It's like enshrined in government policy. It's like, Part of what needs to be detangled though, because often when talking about black people and you know the, the, the lack of what they don't have, it's not taken into account that the various lineages of black people that exist within America, there's a multitude of lineages within America that constitute themselves as black or are categorized as black. But you know, there's a big difference between people that came here willingly as you know, migrants, as opposed to people that are the descendants of people that were taken here 
here in the US unwillingly, which is to say, you know, the, the descendants of slaves, which, you know, off the top, I would suspect that if you were to do a factor analysis, you would probably find a fairly substantive division between people of a lineage of slavery and people of a lineage that is, you know, they migrated within the past few decades, you know? So before we jump into the effects of slavery, I just want to kick it over to friend of the show, pre-masturbatory Louis C.K. You can't take people's, like, historical context away from them. And right. everybody wants this to. Like, white people are always like, come on, it wasn't us. Like, they want black people to forget everything. Like, every year, white people add 100 years to how long ago slavery was. Yeah. <laughs> I've heard educated white people say slavery was 400 years ago. <laughs> no, it very wasn't. <laughs> it was 140 years ago. That's two 70-year-old ladies living and dying back to back. <laughs> That's how recently <laughs> you could buy a guy. Page 28 to 29. A critical point Hannah Jones makes throughout the 1619 project is that not only have we never aligned the ideals of a country founded on Thomas Jefferson's statement that all men are created equal with its practices, but any degree of alignment achieved thus far has been from the efforts of African Americans. When Jefferson wrote those powerful words, he owned 120 enslaved human beings. He knew that his words did not apply to one-fifth of the population and perhaps never would. They also did not apply to women. But African Americans heard those words and were determined to make them true, while all colonial powers such as those of Spain, Portugal, France, and England need to come to terms with the legacy of slavery. And like the US yet to do so, the US was the only colonial power founded on the claim of human equality. That's true. That makes for some uh, pretty bad optics, I will say, you know. Obviously, <laughs> Obviously, slavery is horrendous. However, it is not unique to America whatsoever. Slavery occurred beforehand. Slavery occurred afterwards. Slavery is occurring right now. I don't know if you know this or not. Even, like, the idea of taking black people from Africa, that's not even unique. White people didn't even invent taking black people from Africa. Arabs did. I will if people talk about the enslavement of Africans by Europeans. Only for people understand, at least not understand, but hear something that relates to how the British come here and the Spaniards come in the Caribbean here and take away. They take away from Africa and bring around here to them sugar cane and them cotton. There is a part of slavery that is hardly spoken of, and it don't have nothing to do with white people. It has something to do with the Arabs, the Arab slave trade. The Arab slave trade lasts longer than the white people slave trade. Long before, long before the Europeans got there. So they must part of the enslavement of African people. Long before the Europeans got there. But we hardly hear anybody talk of that aspect of it. As far as I can tell, America's biggest problem, optics-wise at least, is that it became too powerful too soon. Especially off the back of something that certainly in the current day we're like, oh, don't do that, you know? The history of slavery, slavery existed all over the world for thousands of years among all sorts of people as far back as the history of the human species goes. If you were to give reparations to everyone whose ancestors had been slaves, I suspect that you would have to give reparations to more than half the entire population of the globe. Even in the antebellum South, most whites did not have slaves. The cost of one male adult slave was more than the average white person earned all year. It's estimated that 1.4 to 1.6 people in the US own slaves. So that's a minority of people, obviously. But then, you know, the beneficiaries of that are larger because usually the slaves would be under the name of the, the household. But then, of course, maybe they have a family and they also get the benefit of uh, the slaves too, which was 7.6. So I suppose 7.6 of the population were the beneficiaries, whereas, you know, less than 2% were the actual owners. But usually the thing that's held up is like, well, the other people didn't do anything about it, even if they themselves didn't have slaves. So I'm wondering now, let's say, in, you know, 2021, going into 20 
2022 and you know whenever else you're watching this are we going to look back let's say a year a year a hundred years from now if not more if not less in fact the fact that you're watching this means that you own a device at some point in its production line used slave labor does that make you complicit in the system of slavery does that make you as bad as owning a slave slavery aside <laughs> as if you could ever put slavery aside. I'll talk about, I suppose, the, the rest of what's constituted as uh, institutional racism, let's say. Page 44. Professor Peter Wade, a sociologist from the University of Manchester, in explaining how much more complex and insidious racism is than traditional dictionary definitions allow, says racism is an ideology and a practice that produces a society in which some people systemically have less access to resources, power, security, and well-being than others. These systemic inequalities reflect hierarchical differences between people originally created by colonialism, which produces patterns of historical inequality that make it difficult for certain people to access opportunities and resources. If we limit racism's scope to individual acts, then we are actively ignoring the insidious ways it operates. I think that that is probably as good as a definition for systemic racism that you're going to find. I've noticed that a lot of the better points in this book don't come from Robin, but she's citing other people, and this is probably um, one of them. Anyway, shout out to the British, a uh, man like uh, Peter Wade from Manchester, coming in clutch to save the uh, you Yanks. Uh, <laughs> that seems like a pretty good one. Hey, if you fuck over a bunch of people, it seems pretty likely that, you know, you can't do as much with less. I suppose it's fundamentally about probability. If you have more, you have a greater probability of doing well in life insofar as whatever that means, let's say. Whereas if you have less, it's, you know, the, the, the ramp is that much steeper. Because, you know, whenever I've seen, like, I suppose right-wing commentators talk about, like, the idea of white privilege, including black ones for that matter, and they're kind of, like, dismissive of it, and they do this kind of, like, well, what's one thing that you can do that I can't do. Name one thing that you can't do that I can do. Well, you know, the laws have been this way for this amount of time, so what's thing, one thing that you can't do? And it's like, you have to take this thing in its, in its, in more of a full thing anyway, you know, to do this like, kind of like compartmentalization as though you can kind of just like draw a line in the sand as though like so much of this stuff didn't happen beforehand. We are historical creatures, is my point. On page 28 of Nice Racism, there's mention of naturalization law or naturalization laws. You know, in order to be constituted as a US citizen, you had to be white, for instance. I've already mentioned, you know, redlining, Jim Crow laws, and then, as I've mentioned already, the GI Bill. And then, also, here's this fun little headline. CIA says it has found no link between itself and crack trade. That is a real headline from the New York Times, which, you know, there seems to be some real dick riders for the government recently, and I'm like, uh, have you paid attention to how poorly the government has treated pockets of the population over the years, bro? Y'all might want to get the government's dick out your mouth, you know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, really, how could you know, though? How could anyone else know? You know, I mean, you, maybe you should have seen something a little suspicious. I don't know. you think it was like a little suspicious? Just a little suspicious? Every dead black person the police find has crack sprinkled on them. I mean, come on, man. Come on, man. Who gets shot and sprinkles crack on themselves? Nobody will come Bam! Oh, oh! So, you know, even though there's legislative equality, let's say, that's not to say that the stigma has gone away. Like, as I've mentioned already, I'm under no illusion. I, I don't think that racism has gone away in the way that I refer to it. There's some validity to the idea of systemic racism. I think people kind of like bite off more than they can chew using that idea sometimes. But yeah, just because you stop something legislatively is not to say that Oh, all equal now. So for instance, I came across a scene from Mr. Rogers. This is a fairly famous scene. It has Mr. Rogers sharing a pool with a, a black man. And you know, at the time that this came out, apparently this was thought to be revolutionary because this was during the time wherein, you know, the separate pools, all oh, blacks over there, whites over here. This was thought to be revolutionary at the time. This episode came out in 1969. And so to create, I suppose, like a timeline of things, the emancipation of slaves was 1863. Okay, Martin Luther King's speech was 1963. So even though there was the emancipation, blacks still weren't equal for a hundred years. Black people didn't get voting rights until 1965. And so, as I say, this 
particular episode of Mr. Rogers that came out in 1969 after the voting rights. So in theory, black people, hey, all hunky-dory, you're equal, whatever. But then this idea that like a black person and a white person sharing a paddling pool together, which is obviously a metaphor for something, you know, hey, these are not so bad, you know, integration, that kind of thing. There are many ways to say I love you. Just because you solve something legislatively is not to say that, oh, you're all good now, thumbs up, pat you on the bottom, you're on your way, you know? And the stigma kind of pops its head out in some expected ways and some unexpected ways. And, you know, for instance, even here in like the UK, when the Euros were on, you know, there was a, there was the penalties at the end for who would win the Euros or whatever. I'm not a huge football person or soccer if you're from the US. The black ones lost, I don't know what to tell you about the black ones, they let us, oh, they let us down those black boys, you do. I, without a doubt, know that there was some dude that went home and fucking punched his wife and was like, those fucking black. That to me is an obvious uh, example of racism that I'm very much conscious of. But then I even come across like ways that I'm not conscious of whatsoever. For instance. Hey everyone, I wanted to share this. Today, four years ago, I almost got shot for using American Sign Language. Me and my dad friend, we went out to a party. And of course, we was having a good time. We was laying. And I uh, remember that the party was over. We walk outside. We talk about what we want to go out for eat. I remember this guy walk over to us. He was like, you doing up against time. Where you from? Where you from? Where you from? And then he actually had a nerve to pull out the gun and point to all of us. And then we, we were scared, of course, because like, you going to shoot us over this? You think I'm lame Like, really? You ever think about that? You're just trying to communicate with your hands and then someone's like, are you throwing gang signs up at me? Like, what, bro? If, and you can't tell me that if this person, if this woman was white, that would have happened. You know, it's clearly like a racial thing, you know? I'm tired of this thing being so, like, partisan. Some people are like, oh, racism is everything. Some people are like, oh, racism is gone away. It's like, dude, there's enough place for a middle ground. You know what I mean? It's okay. You don't have to be in these camps, these teams. Is there racism? Yes. Is it everything? No. Can we work with some kind of gray here? Please, bro. Please. You know what I mean? What a place to end this first installation of this mini series. I wanted in this episode to get to whiteness defined. So what is meant by whiteness? Uh, but this video is long enough and plus my camera battery dying technology. You know the deal. And then the other thing that I wanted to touch on is this seeming uh, erosion of individuality. So both of those things, you know, the whiteness defined and the erosion of individuality, they will come down the line in the uh, mini series. We got there to give you a little taste of uh, other bits that are to come. Also, the next episode will more so be direct retorts to the book. I think this episode was very theory heavy, so to speak, but I feel like it gives a very good foundation of the things to come. So there's the idea of outwoking. There's also objectification. And also, interestingly, the idea that white silence is violence. We'll be going into that elbow deep. And then obviously toward the end of the miniseries, we will be getting increasingly conclusory, which is to say there will be uh, more daring points made, shall we say, including how white progressives see themselves as well as how white progressives seemingly see black people. As I mentioned earlier in regard to my uh, roller coaster analogy, we're not even at the precipice yet, my broskies. The descent is coming, is what I'm saying. And depending on when you're watching this, you may well indeed be able to just start that next episode right now. And if so, it'll be on the end screen on what will be your right we got there. And maybe I'll just link previous white fragility on the left. Of course, if you haven't already, and I mean, seemingly you found this interesting enough to stick to this point, 
uh, you know, drop a subscribe for the kid, uh, drop a like, because apparently that helps. Also, particularly if you enjoyed the, the ad-free viewing, but would still like to support me or the channel, you can hop over to the Patreon, of which, uh, you know, there will be bonuses and things like that. Drop a comment for the boy. It doesn't matter if it's a week from now or a year from now, because YouTube aggregates them in the studio app thing anyway, so I'll more than likely see it. Share this amongst people if you think they'll be interested, whether that's people in real life or online. And that, I think, for now, is everything. So, uh, as always, thanks for hanging out with me. I had fun hanging out with you. Parasocial relationship game 100. Date